they really produce life in the laboratory? Oh, they haven't even come close. Here's what they did. They took four gases. They took methane, ammonia, water vapor, and hydrogen, ran them through these tubes, ran it through a spark chamber, to, supposed to simulate lightning. <clears throat> and they say, we're going to see, we're going to put them together and make life in the laboratory. At the bottom of the flask, they got this red goo, and they kept draining the goo off, because if it went through the spark again, it would destroy it. So they had to make the goo and then save it from the next spark, okay? They said in the textbook here, it was rich in amino acids, this red goo was. Well, that's simply a lie, okay? They didn't come close to making life. Here the preacher says that the red goo was not rich in amino acids, and he has no evidence to show that at all. Instead, he says that it can't have been amino acids for the reason that this red goo wasn't alive. But as we said in the previous episode of the series, anyone who has actually read the Uri Miller experiments would know that they never even tried to create life. There were a number of different experiments testing variable chemical conditions, and all of them were successful in producing amino acids, which was the goal every time. The red goo was rich in amino acids. That's not a lie. But amino acids are not alive. And this preacher doesn't seem to understand that the synthesis of the building blocks of life is not the same thing as the creation of life. The problem is they had a reducing atmosphere. In other words, he excluded oxygen. You can look at his four gases. There's no oxygen there. He knew if he had oxygen in there, it would oxidize whatever chemicals tried to combine. You know, you cut a banana open and lay it on the table, it turns brown, it oxidizes. You don't paint your car and it oxidizes, it rusts. Well, living, living cells will, try will oxidize quickly in the presence of oxygen. So he didn't put any oxygen in there. That creates a serious problem because if you, if you have oxygen, you cannot get life to come from non-living chemicals. Correction, you can only get life from non-living chemicals under natural conditions in an anoxic environment because while oxygen is necessary for most familiar life forms now, it would have been damaging to the formation of the first cells. And there are organisms that don't need any oxygen at all, and that would actually find oxygen poisonous. For example, we know of some anaerobic bacteria that can ex only exist in isolated caves in such places where there's no oxygen to poison them. And the environments where those organisms live are also poisonous to us. The Miller-Urey experiments excluded oxygen because geologists said that there wasn't likely any oxygen in the atmosphere to the prebiotic earth, so Urey and Miller had to account for the data they were given. The problem is ozone is made from oxygen, and ozone blocks UV light, and UV light destroys ammonia, and ammonia is one of the four gases he's got. So you cannot get life to evolve with oxygen, and you cannot get life to evolve without oxygen. Because if you don't have oxygen, you don't have ozone, and now your ammonia gets destroyed. It's just not going to work either way. Remember that this preacher himself said in an earlier episode that water blocks UV radiation. So it wouldn't matter if there was no ozone. But ozone is not the same thing as the oxide we breathe. Ozone is three oxygen atoms combined, whereas the oxide in the air is in molecules of two. That's why oxygen gas is called O2 because oxygen is a lonely atom desperately seeking connection. If you think that ozone and oxide are the same thing, then get a bottle of O3 and try breathing that instead of O2. He won't do that for long. Even if you breathe O2 mixed with O3, it'll still cause painful damage. And remember that you need oxygen to make carbon dioxide. And scientists say that CO2 would have been more abundant than O2, but even though there is O2 in it, you still can't live breathing only carbon dioxide. Likewise, it takes oxygen to make water, too, and hydrogen oxide can be fatal if inhaled. If you think having more oxygen is better, then try drinking H2O2, also known as hydrogen peroxide. Adding another oxygen atom to the molecule makes it a whole other chemical and not the one you need. And taking one away can make a big difference, too. Carbon dioxide is good for plants. They take out the carbon and leave the O2 for us to breathe. But carbon monoxide is poisonous to everything. And the Earth has always had oxygen, even more than today. This guy said, what evidence is there for a primitive methane ammonia atmosphere on Earth? The answer is there is no evidence for it, but much against it. It seems this preacher doesn't read the studies that he cites, because this one he just referred to does not support his claim that there was oxygen even more than today. Instead, this study from 55 years ago rejects an even earlier hypothesis of a methane ammonia atmosphere, saying that geologists have come to favor a different view of an atmosphere composed of carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, nitrogen, and hydrogen. Not methane and ammonia, but not oxygen-rich either. 
we find in general no evidence in the sedimentary distribution of carbon, sulfur, uranium, etc., that an oxygen free atmosphere ever existed on the Earth. While the authors of the cited study found no evidence of that looking where they did, other scientists like Preston Cloud and others did find evidence of that in the form of detrital sediments older than two billion years, containing grains of pyrite, uraninite, and siderite, all minerals containing reduced forms of iron or uranium that are not found in younger sediments because they would be rapidly oxidized in an oxidizing atmosphere. He also noted that continental red beds, which get their color from oxidized hematite, first appear in the geologic record about two billion years ago. And then there are banded iron formations that are partially oxidized iron. And these require both an anoxic deep ocean capable of transporting iron in soluble ferrous form and an oxidized shallow ocean where the ferrous iron is oxidized to insoluble ferric iron and then precipitates into the ocean floor. And these formations peaked two and a half billion years ago and largely disappeared from the geologic record 1,850,000,000 years ago. All of that implies that the atmosphere didn't have much oxygen initially, that it acquired more as time went on, uh, evidently because of stromatolites, anaerobic bacteria that produce oxygen as a waste product. They build stony colonies, and fossils of these colonies have been found all around the world from that time. So these colonies all over the globe have percolated oxygen into the atmosphere for a couple billion years or so. If somebody tells you the early Earth had a reducing atmosphere, you tell them Kent Hovind said they're confused or they're deliberately lying. Because it's not true. The Earth has always had oxygen. Not according to the Bible. Remember that while this preacher thinks that O2 and O3 are the same thing, because both molecules are made entirely of oxygen atoms, he doesn't think that CO2 or H2O count as oxygen, even though they both have oxygen atoms in them. And the reason that's important is that 2 Peter 3.5 says that God made the earth out of water and of water. If all you had to start with was water, then we didn't always have air. Now, you could argue that it's possible to make every element out of hydrogen with some modifications and additions, but not when you add the oxygen component. You can't make iron or lithium, nitrogen, sodium, or silicon out of water. So we know that verse is wrong, that whoever wrote Peter simply assumed that the earth was made out of water, because remember, they, they believed in alchemy back then. And some apologists will argue that it doesn't really say that the rock and metal of the earth were made out of water, that it only means that the earth rises out of the sea and is still in the midst of the sea, which is not just an interpretation of a continent. It's talking about the whole world here, which is not in water. So the choice is whether God made rock out of water or whether the earth is a flat disk under a giant crystal dome. The Bible gives both descriptions, and we know that both of them are wrong. The Bible describes the atmosphere as a solid crystal dome and transparent like molten glass. But it doesn't describe the air that way because the biblical authors had no idea what air was. They didn't know it was particulate matter. They thought that air was supernatural, that the wind was the spirit of God, and that dust devils were literally devils. And they thought that breathing the breath of life was the spirit entering and animating our bodies, and that breathing our last meant giving up the ghost. And when you sneeze or cough, they thought that was the spirit leaving your body and that foul spirits might get in to possess, sicken, or kill you. That's why they say bless you when you sneeze. This article said, it's suggested from the earliest dated rocks at 3.7 billion years ago, Earth had an oxygenic atmosphere. They've always known the Earth had oxygen, even more than we have today. Wrong. The reason you have a few scientists saying maybe there was oxygen and most scientists saying no, there probably wasn't, is because we don't know whether Earth had any oxygen then. We certainly don't know that it had any more than it does today, and there is no evidence whatsoever to indicate that it did. We covered that on seminar part two, how the early Earth probably had even more oxygen, made them live longer. No, having more oxygen in the atmosphere doesn't increase longevity. The preacher is here trying to make excuses for religious apologetics arguing for absurdities like how some characters in the oldest stories of the Bible supposedly lived for hundreds of years. And this is because those stories were originally composed under a different numeric system, based on the number 60, where small marks were used to reduce 60 to 6 or to raise 60 to 600. And these subtle indications were sometimes unintelligible when baked into clay tablets, and the system of counting was also awkward and difficult to translate into modern decimal metrics. 
That's why our translations of those old tablets today say that the earliest of the Sumerian kings reigned for tens of thousands of years before this preacher thinks the earth was even created. This textbook says, there was no oxygen on the earth, which is a lie. And then it says, the rocks absorbed it. <laughs> Hello? <laughs> How can they absorb it if it wasn't there? Well, think about it. Assuming a mostly anoxic atmosphere in the beginning as indicated by the reducing conditions evident in geology, then as stromatolites raised the quantity of oxygen, it was first absorbed into the water and then into iron ore. Then the oxygen being pumped into the air was absorbed by the rocks until they achieved a level of saturation such that the continued flow of oxygen from stromatolites eventually accounted for 21% of the atmosphere. And ultimately, these bacteria killed themselves off by overpolluting the planet. And the organisms that inherited the now oxygenated world adapted the use of this newly available gas for additional energy. And whether there was an anoxic atmosphere in the prebiotic Earth is not a lie. That is a probability indicated by the evidence we just described, which creationists cannot account for, nor even consider. Second problem they had with the Miller experiment, they filtered out the product. That is not realistic for nature, okay? They saved the goo from getting sparked the second time because it would have destroyed it. Because they're essentially using a test tube to simulate a global environment where lightning strikes here or there every now and again, but not everywhere constantly. So this minimal degree of idealization is actually much more realistic than what the preacher suggests they do instead. What he actually made in this experiment was 85% tar, 13% carboxylic acid. Now both of those are poisonous to life. If you make a mixture that's 98% poisonous to the other 2%, I don't think it's logical to say you've succeeded in creating anything that's going to help make life, okay? I can see where you'd want to have less tar, even if that means less flavor. But carboxylic acids are generally tart in taste and are thus used widely in the food industry. So how poisonous are they, really, since they're in our food and we ingest them all the time? That all depends on concentration, and we're talking about a whole planet here, not just a test tube. And remember also that this was long before we would have what would eventually qualify as life floating in the water above and entirely separate from the remaining tar. The problems are he made mostly only two amino acids. There are 20 different ones required to make life. 20 different amino acids. Now, these amino acids are kind of like letters of the alphabet, okay? You have to have 26 letters in the English alphabet to make all the words that we have. Well, you have to have 20 different amino acids to make all the proteins that your body has. With those 20 different amino acids, your body can build a bazillion different kinds of proteins, kind of like you can make a lot of different words with the same 26 letters, okay? What he actually made was a couple of letters, like two of the letters of the alphabet, by combining these gases. That might have been all they knew about with the equipment that they had in the 1950s. But after Stanley Miller died in 2007, one of his students, Jeffrey Beta, inherited an old box of Miller's original samples from the volcano in a bottle experiment from way back in 1953. Reanalyzed with the advantage of modern high-performance liquid chromatography, Beta realized that those, those original extracts actually produced no less than 22 amino acids, several of which Miller himself had never seen when he was alive. This creates a real problem since half of them were left-handed and half of them were right-handed. What he actually made was amino acids, only two of them, and half of them were backwards. I mean, if I drop letters of the alphabet, there's a 50-50 chance some of them are going to land upside down. They don't do any good. You have to have them all facing the right way. The smallest proteins we know of have about 70 to 100 amino acids, all of them facing the right way. This greatly compounds the problem, okay? I should add that biochemists also now know of a ribosome that can use either left or right-handed RNA templates to exclusively synthesize right-handed versions, effectively solving the problem of homochirality. DNA and RNA are all right-handed, all other proteins are left-handed. It's a very puzzling fact, all proteins that have been investigated from animals, plants, and higher organisms, and from simple organisms, bacteria, molds, even viruses, are made of left-handed amino acids. They're all that way. And that, I think, should be indicative of a single universal ancestry for all life currently on this planet. So he's really got a problem since half of his letters were backwards. And there are hundreds of amino acids required to combine in just the right way to make a protein. And they unbond in water faster than they bond. And they claim this all happened in the oceans. Well, the oceans are completely full of water. All the way to the bottom. At least nine amino acids are hydrophobic and don't unbond the way this preacher implies that they would.
and some are less hydrophobic or partially so, or they are indifferent. So this situation too is not like the preacher makes it out to be. And Brownian motion is going to drive them apart. It's not going to put them together. Does this preacher think we're talking about a whole ocean of clear, purified water except where these chemicals are in this one area? We're talking about a primordial soup, remember? So Brownian motion wouldn't really be a thing under these conditions. One of the lies in the textbooks is that they made life in the laboratory. They have all they've done, every experiment has made the problem worse for the evolutionist, okay? There has never been any experiment in origin of life research that ever made anything worse for evolution. Just like there's never been any relevant experiment or discovery that didn't make things worse for creationism. Scientists actually have artificially assembled organisms genetically that then went on to live and grow and reproduce. And they've created synthetic organisms in the sense that a substantial portion of the genome or the entire genome has been deliberately designed or engineered by human scientists. And my favorite example of that is an entirely artificial lifelike material that even has metabolism and can reproduce. But that doesn't help us. That only shows how we as intelligent designers could build life. The purpose of all these origin of life experiments that we listed in this episode and in the previous one were to find out how life originated without a designer. And while we still don't know all of that yet, we definitely know some of it, a lot more than the science deniers care to know about. The spontaneous generations do not occur spontaneously in water. Life is not going to get started in this way. Here the preacher is misquoting a textbook from a quarter century ago that is not talking about spontaneous generation like he apparently thinks it does. The very next sentence from the quoted paragraph, which he omitted from this quote, says, however, most scientists no longer argue that the first proteins assembled spontaneously. Instead, they now propose that the initial macromolecules were composed of RNA and that RNA later catalyzed the formation of proteins. And this study from just a couple years ago says that proteins are comprised of amino acids. Proteins in the biological environment are surrounded by water molecules which play crucial roles in the protein structure, function, and dynamics. So have you noticed that nothing this preacher has ever said or that any creationist has ever said has been verifiably true, logically valid, and indicative of their conclusion? And this includes all of their attempted criticisms of science. None of them have turned out to be the way they, they make it out to be either. That's all they can do is criticize science because creationism cannot perform any experiments and refuses to submit to any form of testing. Creationism cannot contribute to human understanding because there's none of it that can be shown to be true and it does not produce results. The best it can do, because there's an awful lot of bad that creationism does or causes, but the best it can do is just complain about applications of science and philosophy that work and that actually do some good. 